Hello, listeners, and welcome back to I'm Not the Book Expert, But She Is. I am your first host, Rachel, and our expert this week is... It's me, Maggie, your other co-host of this podcast. Woot woot. And this week, we are going to be talking about Warcross by Marie Lu, which is the first book in our third duology that we're discussing this season, so... I'm very excited. Um, Marie Lu is one of my favorite authors, and I'm excited to introduce Rachel to this book and her writing. Which, just for the context, we've already read it, and I did very much enjoy it. So Yes, I'm I'm very glad you enjoyed it. I I have to admit, I was a little nervous, because this is so, this feels very different from the last two duologies we've read. Like, yeah. Like one of us is lying and one of us is next. Very murder mystery, very high schooly. Vicious is very vicious and vengeful were very dark and like they were just dark. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> and Warcross, I would not say it's lighthearted, but it definitely has a different vibe. It's much more like sci-fi and futuristic. Yeah. I think at least. So I was like, oh no, I don't I know Rachel doesn't really particularly like most sci-fi so I was a little nervous but I'm really glad that she enjoyed it it's not that I dislike sci-fi it's just sometimes sci-fi seems too unbelievable but that sounds weird because I do really like fantasy but like there are just aspects of sci-fi where it's like "Mm, but is it though the the suspension of disbelief isn't there I think sometimes sci-fi takes itself almost too seriously Mm -hmm. to the point where it's not so much that it's unrealistic it's just impractical yes that's kind of my impression warcross and wildcard very much felt like things that could happen yes for sure and we're definitely probably going to talk about that during this episode oh for sure but before we get into that maggie what have you been reading recently um, so other than warcross and wildcard i almost read off your list by the way that would have been a mistake (laughs) um other than Warcross and Wildcard, I've been reading The Doctor's Blackwell by Janice P. Nimora. Um, so I've been listening to that on audiobook and I'm really enjoying it. It was um, a really good book. Yes. I read so it. I'm <laughs> this was enough. To be fair, it was a Rachel recommendation, but only because she got to it before I did. I had this is true. heard about it before. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was part of our uh Goodreads. Mm-hmm. Um uh winner's episode and I said I wanted to read it and I did and you did and now I am and I'm almost done with it I think I've got about 20 percent of the audiobook left oh, that's not that bad but and it is a nonfiction book for anyone who's listening about mm-hmm. the first two female doctors in the United States yes which were Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell yes hence the reason it is called the doctors, the doctors Blackwell, Blackwell. Um, I actually didn't know this until I looked at the author's Goodreads page, but she also wrote another book that I wanted to read a couple years ago called Daughters of the Samurai, um, which I believe is also nonfiction. And I I found it at the library and then just didn't get it. So maybe I'll have to pick that up after reading this. Do it. Why not? Why not? Indeed. What have you been reading lately, Rachel? Rachel? So it has only been one week since we last recorded. So hopefully we're picking up back on our our podcast role here. Um, I sure hope so. Seriously. I (laughs) finished Warcross and Wildcard this week. Big surprise there. Um, But I also read The Grimrose Girls by Laura Poole, I think is how you say her last name. P-O-H-L. Poole or Pole, maybe. Somewhere in that which is a, a retelling of a bunch of fairy tales. And it, it was a little cheesy, but it was very nice <laughs> after reading Vicious and Vengeful to have something a little bit more lighthearted. Mm-hmm. But I say that with a grain of salt because it was still a murder mystery. So like... <laughs> <laughs> lighthearted in comparison to everything else that Rachel reads. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There was still a lot of death Uh, in there, but it's fine. It's it's fine. fine. We're all fine. Everything's fine. Also, before Um, I forget, I'm going to set the timer for us so I know how long that we're recording. Yes. But although we've been doing pretty well with this lately, I've been proud. This is true. Yeah. Other than the Grimrose Girls, I'm currently between books because I literally just finished it yesterday 
and then slept in today because I was in a wedding yesterday. So just lots of things happening all at once. That's very exciting though. Being in weddings is fun. So I'm told. It's a lot of fun. It, it is a lot of fun. Well, oh, good. depends on who you are in the wedding, but normally it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Good. I say as someone who has been a maid of honor and a bride and a bridesmaid. It's a lot sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> You're very popular. Oh, and I was a flower girl when I was a little kid. So like, Aww. yeah, cute things. That's adorable. <laughs> But are we ready to get into our discussion? I think so. I think, yeah, I was going to say there isn't much else for us to talk about to start off with. Take it away, Rachel. Here we go. In a not so distant future, virtual and augmented reality has become a way of life for people around the world thanks to the invention of the Neuralink. Not only does the Neuralink make daily life easier, but it also includes Warcross, a competitive virtual reality game where top players can quickly become international celebrities. When bounty hunter Amika Chen accidentally hacks her way into the opening game of the Warcross Championships, she catches the eye of the game's creator, Hideo Tanaka, and he has an important job for her. Yes. So, and that starts us off on this whole very grand adventure in reality and virtual reality. Indeed. I love these books. So I am going to run through the trigger warnings real quick for Warcross. Um, As always, the full list is linked in the description. Um, I did have to go to a different website this time because the source that I usually use did not have Warcross. Um, But I did find a list and I felt it was pretty comprehensive. So... Just real quick, um, some of the trigger warnings included for Warcross are death of a parent, murder and attempted murder, gun violence, explosions, a kidnapping is recounted, um, there's a disappearance of a loved one, bullying is recounted, and there's also themes of poverty, including the threat of eviction early on in the book. Um, And I did just want to throw out there real quick, um, we're basing all of the character and like name pronunciations all of that is based on the audiobook which I listened to part of and Rachel listened to the whole thing so Mm -hmm. just because there are some like tricky terms and stuff in here so anything that we say wrong um it is possibly my mistake but it is also I will also blame the audiobook narrator just just pass the blame along pass the blame the buck does not stop here (laughs) no it does not yeah um, where do we want I'm, to start Maggie I'm, I'm trying to think <laughs> well okay uh, can I can I kick us off a little bit sure okay so just to preface this because mm-hmm. Maggie and I have been talking about this for the last week um I really took this book to heart and you did I did. And uh, at one point, Maggie asked a question just generally. And I was like, oh, no, no, like this has a happy ending. Like this little thing has a happy ending in the book. (laughs) (laughs) And Maggie was like, are you the book expert now? And the answer is still no. Mm -hmm. But I I did take some of this to heart. Okay. I'm not, I'm not. I have a little obsession. I bought the books. It's fine. I'm glad Um, you did. I am too. I did buy them used from thrift books. So like I didn't go out and buy brand new copies, but I also didn't, I don't feel the need to buy brand new copies Mm -hmm. of most of my books. Like I agree. I actually kind of like to buy used copies of books. I did that a lot in college and I ended up um, for one of my, I know I've told you this before, Rachel, but you're just going to have to bear with me because I'm going to tell the story for (laughs) the podcasters now. It's super cryptic. In college, one I we had to read Paradise Lost for one of my classes. Oh yes, <laughs> and <laughs> I had bought this copy of Paradise Lost used. And most of the time, when I buy a used copy of something, especially like a textbook, it usually has a lot of markup in it, like people highlighting things. Mm-hmm. This one had a lot of markup, and like some of the most inane comments I had ever seen a human being make in the margins of a text. And so, when we got to the end of the semester, and our professor said. Um, 
hey, I'll, I'll let you guys, like, you can either write like a regular reflection paper or you can write a creative essay based on your reading of this book. And I said, hey, professor, can I do a creative essay where I write a letter to the person who owned this book before me? Um, and he said, yes. Yeah. So that is what I wrote one of my final papers of college on. <laughs> was just roasting the person who had owned that book before me. So if you're out there and you sold a used copy of Paradise Lost on Amazon, um, my apologies, but also thanks for getting me a good grade. I love it. I also love that professor. So it just brings me so much joy. Yes. Um, so all that to say, I actually do really like buying used books and it's mm. also good for the environment and good for everybody involved. And it's less money to Jeff Bezos, which we all appreciate. I was going to say, and somewhat selfishly, it's usually less money from my wallet. In yes, exactly. <laughs> so, but I am but, very glad that you bought Warcross and Wildcard. I did, and they're supposed to be here on Tuesday, so I'm very Woo! excited. Um, but where I wanted to start was talking about New York City, where Amika Chen is living and mm -hmm. how the neural link works kind of in everyday life. Yeah. So I let me talk I want to talk a little bit about the neural link real quick and this is going to get a little bit nerdy but I'm going to try to not be like mansplaining video games to you mostly cuz I only barely know what I'm talking about. Nerdy question? I know. Shocking. Weird. So the neural link is it's more than just a video game thing it's I I don't I try I don't want to say this word because it really got thrown around a lot lately but it's basically the metaverse right so it's more of a metaverse thing but except Mark Zuckerberg's not involved um and the neural the way it works is it now remember this is sci-fi so it is going to sound a little far-fetched but I also think this is very much in the realm of possibility the neural link syncs up to the user's brain, right? So you either have a pair of glasses or later on um, you can use it with contact lenses. Mm -hmm. And so it, it basically syncs up to the user's brain and uses that instead of having like an external computer um, to have to power it and generate all this imagery, it uses the brain to do it. Um, and... Yeah, so the Neuralink, it uses a mixture of augmented reality and virtual reality. If you don't know what the difference is, augmented reality is like when the real world gets overlaid with some kind of virtual world. So if you played Pokemon Go a couple years ago, it's like when you pull out your phone to catch a Pikachu and Pikachu looks like it's in your living room on your phone screen, right? That's mm -hmm. augmented reality. Virtual reality is more about full immersion. So like if you ever played like Beat Saber on an Oculus Quest or whatever the newest model is, I forget. But like where you, those are when you usually see the things with like the big bulky goggles and all that. So mm -hmm. that's what gets used in the Warcross games itself. Whereas like for everyday life, like when Amika's walking through New York City trying to catch her bounty through the Neuralink, she can say like, hey, I need to get to point A and her Neuralink glasses will be like, okay, here's your, here's your path. And she will see that path showing up in front of her in real time as she walks through New York City. I, Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> yes, I was just going to say, I think that a really good way to differentiate, especially for me, is when I watched the movie Free Guy, um, when he puts on the glasses, his reality becomes augmented reality. But for anybody else watching it, it is more of a, um, the other one. Virtual reality? Yes, thank you. So his reality is everybody else's virtual reality, but when he puts the glasses on, it becomes his augmented reality. Gotcha. I have not seen Free Guy, so I'm going to take your word for it on that one. I'm going to give you a pass on that one because that's a relatively new movie. So like I've, in my defense, I have not gone to the movies in two years. And I don't, I have been meaning to watch that, but I just have not. The next time you visit, we can watch it because it's on Disney Plus now. We'll add it to the list. <laughs> yes, we will. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, 
so yeah, I know it seems a little far-fetched to say like, oh, this entire like really immersive virtual and augmented reality is powered by like a pair of glasses that you wear and your brain. I know that seems a little far-fetched, but this is sci-fi. This is set in the future. And I do think that this is something that could be achieved. And not that I know anything about technology, but like this does not seem like a distant future somewhere. It also just makes more sense as a plot device. Um, I'm not going to name names, but there are other books that there is other media that has used this virtual reality um, thing. Rachel's laughing. It just took me a second to figure out who you were talking about. <laughs> Cause I know who you're talking about. I cannot speak the name. Um, <laughs> Well, I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like in in general, in other media, a lot of times when you talk about virtual reality, there's like, oh, you have like this whole helmet or these goggles and like these gloves and the thing and the you walk on a treadmill to walk around and stuff. It just feels bulky as a storytelling device, especially in text. Whereas like Marie Lou can just be like, okay, Amika puts on her glasses and now she's in Warcross. Like, it just feels a lot cleaner as a storytelling device as well. Amika at one point is literally just like sitting at her kitchen table with the Warcross glasses mm-hmm. on and like, that's how it is. And I love yeah. that I'm here for it. I really appreciate that. Total tangent. But you know what doesn't get talked about? What? What if somebody needs prescription lenses? Can you get okay. prescription Neuralink glasses? I also thought about that. And I don't see why the glasses wouldn't just fix it in either augmented or virtual reality. Oh, see, that's interesting. Right? Like, I almost saw it almost as a computer screen when you're doing augmented reality. Mm-hmm. So why couldn't it just fix the lens so that way you could always see? That makes sense. A question that I would have is how would it work for somebody who is blind and or deaf? Yeah, I know with the original glasses, they have a separate ear piece, I think. But with the contacts, I don't think that would be an issue. Right, but how would they like process the information if they don't know what it is like to experience sight or sound? I don't know. That's a really good question. I'm here for figuring out the disability Mm -hmm. rep for people that aren't represented in the original story. Mm -hmm. Because we do have disability rep in this book. Yeah, which I actually do want to talk about later because I thought that was also really good. And that's also one of my favorite side characters, but that's besides the point. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so the Neuralink, I, I don't know what I was gonna say because now I'm thinking about this. How does it how does how does it work for people who are blind? Right? Can your could your brain like if it okay? I'm obviously not a doctor or a scientist. I'm just an English major, barely surviving <laughs> out here. Can I'm, your brain, could your brain still process an image if something like Obviously, you need your eyes to process images, right? But could, Mm -hmm. hypothetically, could a machine circumvent that and provide your brain with images without needing your eyes to do it? I think it depends on if somebody has had sight in the past. So Ah. somebody like our professor who went blind, he probably could. But somebody who was like born without eyes has never experienced what it's like to be sighted. Mm Mm-hmm might not be able to could a brain learn a brain probably could learn it it's kind of i'm i'm thinking of my very limited knowledge of like cochlear implants for people who are deaf right um, and how a lot of adults don't have success with cochlear implants like if Mm -hmm. they got cochlear implants when they are older because it's a different way of processing the information right it be it's it's a challenge for especially parents hearing parents who have children who are deaf 
um, deciding at a really young age, like a couple of months old, if they want to give their child cochlear implants or not. And then it becomes an ethical dilemma of, do I send my child into this invasive surgery that destroys any chance of them having any of their residual hearing and being part of the deaf community or like that debate of what side of this coin am I going to put my child on? Mm -hmm. So maybe, but not, it's not guaranteed. Right. So like the neural link obviously isn't as invasive as a cochlear implant surgery. Right. But like, I I just think that's really interesting to think about. And I wonder Mm -hmm. if Marie Lou thought about that at all during her writing process. Yes. That is, yeah. I have something to say. I'm just bringing all the words together. I think that brings something really interesting just to think about in writing in general. Like, especially with science fiction, because you are presenting a world, and even with like something like fantasy, right? How does how does magic or quite frankly, in sci-fi, the magic is often technology that doesn't exist yet, right? Or, and sometimes they can coexist, but like for all intents and purposes, how does the magic of your world interact with the daily lives of people who are disabled, right? Yeah, and I think that's an interesting question, especially when it comes to representation, because there are different Mm -hmm. disabilities that are easier to represent in different situations. Mm -hmm. Like in this case, the, the character with a disability has mobility issues, which are solved with Warcross, like when they are in the game, I'm intentionally using they, them. So I don't spoil before we get to it. Right. Um, Right. They don't have mobility issues in the game and they Mm -hmm. don't have it in their virtual reality but in their augmented and real reality, they, they do. And it's something that yeah. they face, but that was kind of quote unquote, an easy disability to represent. Right. Not saying that it is an easy disability to have, because I would say there's no easy disability to have. Right. But it's, it is much easier as the writer to explain that in the story rather than someone who has a visual disability or like is deaf or something like that. Right. And continuing on with this train, sorry, this is a total sidetrack and was not at all part of our notes for today. I mean, we were probably going to talk about it eventually. So keep going. It also makes me think about people who have some sort of neurological disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, So we've it, it, we're kind of hitting the points that directly interact with the neural link. So right. the, the sight, the hearing, but then what if they have some sort of like intellectual disability mm-hmm. or have some sort of processing disability? Like how do we as readers kind of view that or how would it change or how did Marie Lou address it or not address it? Or how would the neural link interact with somebody who maybe has those issues? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you couldn't tell our listeners, again, <laughs> teacher, but I'm also part of the disability community. So like these are things mm-hmm. that are really important to me. Yeah. But what do you have to say, Maggie? I was just going to say, and I don't think, and I, you can correct me if you don't agree with me, but I think it would be fair to say, we're not asking, we're not asking this author to write a whole essay on how does this fictional device that she created interact with every aspect of everybody's life but these are interesting things to think about as we're reading and yeah just how does these are things as readers that we continue to think about beyond the book and I think that's a good thing to think about those things and that can lead to I think you know what is the story that I that I or somebody else might tell if Warcross was their book. And that's how we get other things like, man, wouldn't yeah. book X be really interesting if element whatever was different or if character was like me instead of like this. Agreed. And and I totally agree with your first statement as well. I'm not expecting Marie Lou to like write me a 50 page essay about a character right. that she originally envisioned or how this would solve this or that problem. It's yeah. just- these are interesting aspects to me. Exactly. And I think it's important to talk about those things too. 
Yeah. So do you want to talk about the characters since we're already kind of talking about them? Yes, I love them. Okay. (laughs) I could see your excited face. And then I was like, Rachel, you're muted. So let's talk about the characters. Yes. Um, so our the heroine of the story, we've already introduced her, Amika Chen. She is a bounty hunter and a hacker. Mm-hmm. And I also just want to talk about like her appearance real quick, which we don't normally discuss on the podcast, but she dyes her hair in rainbow colors and she has a really cool tattoo sleeve, which I just thought were really nice details and also just goals. I concur. I also thought it was interesting um, that, what is she, I forget the name of the piece now, but like she has the notes of a Mozart song in her tattoo somewhere, which yes, if you don't, don't know, know which song. <laughs> yeah, but if you don't know, Marie Lu actually wrote another book called The Kingdom of Back. So in The Kingdom of Back, she writes a story from the perspective of Mozart's older sister, who was also a gifted composer in her own right and was a real person. That is also a very good book. So I thought that was a really neat connection that she made to another one of her pieces. And actually, Warcross is full of those little Easter eggs. I was seeing that on Pinterest. Yes, it's good. Rachel doesn't know any of them because she's only read these, but it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll convert her eventually. I am playing catch up, Maggie. I'm working on it. We are going to, I am going to force her either on this podcast or just in general to read the Legend trilogy someday. It's good. (laughs) If you liked Warcross, you would like Legend. Well, I'm very excited. Good. So anyway, Amika. um, I love Amika. she's, She's great. I really appreciated her as a heroine. I concur. Um, She might have actually been my favorite character in the whole series. Really? Which is surprising because I don't normally like main characters. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I loved Amika. I really admired her tenacity throughout the whole series, throughout the whole duology, and especially in Warcross because she really hasn't had it easy, like, Her parents split up, her father passed away, and she inherited all of his gambling debts, which is delightful. Mm -hmm. Um, She stood up. I'm going to give the very short version of this. Um, One of her classmates was getting bullied, and in retaliation, Amika hacked into, like, the school's database and basically doxed all of the students who were bullying her. And staff. And staff, yes. I was ready to throw hands with Mm -hmm. I had a feeling you would um, dislike that. I was so mad. And by doxed, I just mean like she exposed their personal information and exposed them for bullying this girl. Mm -hmm. And But because she did that through hacking, she was expelled and also gathered a criminal record. And because of that criminal record, she couldn't get a good job. And now she just does bounty hunting to try and survive. So then I guess we'll talk about, I would consider him the main male character, Hideo Tanaka. So he's, he's the creator behind Warcross and the Neuralink. um, And also the Mm -hmm. founder of Henke Games, which is the company that runs all this stuff. He's basically a young prodigy he's only 21 um in this book which i know that's younger than i am right now which is a little terrifying (laughs) um why are we squinting rachel because hideo tanaka is a com like when you combine it combines into hanka oh my gosh (laughs) how did i not notice that well, I'm just noticing it. But in my defense, I was listening to it and I didn't see it written down. Huh. I didn't notice that. That makes total sense. I also kind of thought, hold on, I need to look up this person's name. Just at, at, while we're going on tangents, this is totally not founded at all. Um, but there's a pretty famous video game designer named Hideo Kojima. Um, and I kind of have a feeling that Hideo was named after him. That is that just a, a theory. I have I have no reason to back that up. Um, but he's the guy behind like the Metal Gear games, um, 
the newest one that he worked on was Death Stranding, which was really popular. I've not played any of them. I just recognize the name. Um, but well, yeah, you're more on top of it than I am. That I was just a little three video games, Maggie. Correction: I played four video games, Maggie. Four so, whole games. Four whole entire games. I'm so proud. Meanwhile, I played a three-hour demo of a new video game the other day, and I was like, man. Am I ready to drop $60 on a game right after I finished playing another $60 game? The answer was no, but maybe after I get paid. What game did you finish? Um, I finished the Pokemon game I was playing. I mean, I finished the story. I'm probably still going to keep playing it. Understandable. I mean, we have both done that with Hades. Technically, we finished the storyline. Oh, you're not even, you haven't even gotten the full ending yet, Rachel. I mean, no, I haven't, but like we've reached the end, Eric. The end, yes. Yes. So anyway, Hideo. Um, yeah, so he's the inventor behind the Neuralink and Warcross. His mother was a neuroscientist and his father was a repair technician. And so their backgrounds and expertise kind of contribute to Hideo eventually creating this invention that is technological and also works with neuroscience, which is pretty cool. He's always poised and polite. Um, it seems very impossible to catch him off guard and he's very businesslike, which sometimes makes him seem cold. Um, I thought it was funny when at one point when he's first talking to Amika after he hires her for this special job, she says something Mm -hmm. like, well, why didn't you just ask me that outright? And it made me laugh. I just thought that was very telling of his character. Within both of their personalities. Yes. (laughs) He also does not talk much about his family or personal life and just tends to be closed off in general. Literally all we know about his family is that like his mother was a neuroscientist and his dad did the repairs. What are the two rules that Amika is supposed to follow when talking to Hideo? It's don't ask about his family and I don't forget, I don't, I don't forget. I don't remember the other one. But the big one is like, you're not allowed to ask about his family. So don't do it. Don't ask about his family. He's not going to talk to you about it. Like everything about him is very contained. Mm-hmm. I'm going to find it now. Please hold. Holding. I'm um, going to continue okay. pushing. We're talking about that. We're talking about him. Here we go. The first rule, no photos are allowed during the meeting. Second, you will need to sign an agreement stating that you won't publicly discuss what you're told here. And third, I must request that you must never ask Mr. Tanaka's, sorry, Mr. Tanaka any questions about his family or their private affairs. This is a company-wide policy and one that Mr. Tanaka is very strict about maintaining. That's from page 84 of the hardcover. Got it. Um. Hideo is also assisted at Henka Games by his longtime friend, Ken Edon. Um, They met each other at Oxford, and he's the creative director at Henka Games. He's much more friendly than Hideo is. Um, That's an understatement. (laughs) (laughs) If, If Hideo is like a cat just vibing in a corner, Ken is much more like a golden retriever. Not quite excitable, but a little bit more outgoing. Um, so I have a work coworker. Mm-hmm. You know this coworker. <laughs> um, and we have this little bit going looking for dynamic duos that represent us. Mm-hmm. And one of them is librarian cat and golden retriever. Maggie, I'll let you figure out who's who. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might know. You probably definitely know. Are you the cat? So surprised. Just can't. Just can't. (laughs) We've also, the other dynamic duos are Shrek and Donkey. I am Shrek. (laughs) Batman and Robin. I am Batman. (laughs) Um, Good, good. The other ones. Sherlock and John Watson. I'm Mm -hmm. Sherlock. Makes Um, sense. So any character that has the more energy is him. And any character that's the like laid back brooding one, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> 
So now you have all of these analogies that we can also apply to Hideo and Ken. Yes. I really liked Ken. Me too. I kept texting you. Do you remember? Rachel (laughs) kept texting me and like, is Ken a good guy? Is Ken going to do something bad? I feel like I shouldn't trust him, but he seems really nice. Yep. (laughs) Ken does not do anything bad in this book. That is correct. That is correct. And moving right along. um, I put the antagonist here next, but I actually kind of want to come back to him maybe. That's fine. He's only one of the antagonists. Well, I mean... He's the main antagonist for this book. For this book. I know. Yeah. So normally, Rachel and I record episodes, like, after each book, but this time we read both Warcross and Wildcard in such a short time that I had a hard time pulling apart the events of each book. In both of our defenses... They read really fast. They did read really fast. That is one thing I think is pretty common for all of Marie Lou's work. And I don't think that's a criticism. I just think like she writes really clean prose mm-hmm. and it just moves very quickly. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to- I guess to... we can talk about Zero real quick. Zero's the main antagonist. We don't know his real identity or really what he's after. We just know that he's a hacker breaking into some of the Warcross worlds and messing with the code. And Hideo hires Amika. He's like, hey, I saw you hacked into the World the World Cross, the Warcross World Championships. Um, hey, can I hire you? Since you seem to be so good at getting around my code, I'm gonna hire you to hunt down this guy who's trying to mess with my creation. He doesn't Mm -hmm. say it like that, obviously. That's the Spark Notes version. But so, yeah, that is Amika's target. That is the main antagonist. We don't really know why he's out to get Warcross or Hideo, but he needs to be stopped, obviously. Yeah. But because, go ahead. I had feelings about Zero in the first book because I Mm -hmm. didn't. Again, this is my fault for having not read them, like physically read them. Mm-hmm. But I thought we knew who Zero was for like half of the book because of the one character who ended up working with Zero. Oh, yeah. Because he is also coded as a Zero. Right. But that was all my fault. But I, yeah. I have mixed feelings about Zero from this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also, like, despite being the main antagonist, Zero really doesn't do a whole lot in this book specifically. He does blow up their compound. Okay, but, like, but... (laughs) what? That's not what I was trying to say. Yes, you are correct. But what I mean is... he doesn't feel as real as a certain other character who's also on the bad guy's side. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Because we don't really know Zero's identity, Zero feels almost more like a phantom than like a real force. Even though, yes, he does blow up um, where all the Warcross players are staying. That is true, and that is terrible. Yes. For as much as Zero is a hacker... And hackers don't tend to be physically violent. He is very physically violent. Yes. Agreed. Um, but yeah, since Amika hacked her way into the opening game of the Warcross championships and everybody saw it because everybody was tuned in, um, when Hideo hires her, he, set, he decides they're going to hide her in plain sight. And so she is mm-hmm. entered as a wild card, which into the championships so each there are warcross is a competitive video game kind of like if you follow like overwatch league or something like that there's there are organized teams they have captains and players and they all compete in these games Mm -hmm. um and during the championships every year each team picks two wildcard players which are pulled from the top players around the world who aren't currently on a specific team and so Amika is entered as one of those wildcard players. 
at like a level what 24 yeah at a level 24 which and is ev- super low mm-hmm. so everyone kind of writes it off as being a publicity stunt right like oh this is just hanka games trying to do the thing or whatever be part of the cool crowd be part of the cool crowd except you want to know what happens rachel I was so, I I didn't know if I was going to like this book and then this happened and I just felt even more insecure about my like for this book. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me what happened. She gets picked first. She's the number one draft pick out of 40 (laughs) other players who are, quite frankly, they're a lot better than she is. No offense, Amika, but like, and they're proven competitors. Yes. And she is not. All we know about her is that, she, I mean, all that the world knows about her is that she hacked into the game, which like, oopsies. But yeah, she's the first draft pick. It was in that moment where I was like, oh no, 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 I can't read another book I don't like. This is going to stop me from reading. Like, ah. I did feel like that was a little bit on the nose. It was very um, Katniss Everdeen getting the highest score in her Hunger Games. Yes. So like, you know, that's fun. (laughs) Yes, that's fair. What made you think you weren't going to like it? Is that why? Were you just nervous that? I was just really nervous after Vengeful that I was going to go in a downward spiral. Not that I don't like your recommendations because normally I do. Right? Right. Yeah. Maggie's making a face at me. (laughs) You had me really worried there for a second. Why? I was so thought you were going to say you don't like my recommendations. No, I like your recommendations most of the time. Okay, good. Most of the time. (laughs) Okay, all I'm thinking about is vengeful, okay? I know, I know, I'm sorry. I have apologized profusely. Indeed. And it, I didn't dislike Vicious. Like, I loved Vicious. Mm-hmm. It was just the sequel that I didn't like too much. But I was just worried. That I had this little inkling of fear that I wasn't going to like them because it, it kind of hits the points that I don't like, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's sci-fi. I just got off reading another book I didn't like. Like, it, it had a couple of points where I was like, oh, Yeah. Oh, okay. But I ended up really liking it, especially Mm -hmm. once we started getting introduced to some of the other characters. Yes. I was going to say, things definitely take a turn. Not that the beginning of the book is bad, but I think things really take a turn for the better once Amika is on her Warcross team and we get introduced to some of the other players. I agree. So Amika gets recruited to the Phoenix Riders, who are a pretty popular team, but they've not had good years the last couple of years. Agreed. And I'll run through the roster quick, and then I think we should talk about each of the players. Um, So the team captain is Asher Wing, and they all have different positions. So there's five positions on a Warcross team. There's the captain, there's the thief, which on the Phoenix Riders is Hamilton or Hammy Jimenez, I think is how you say her name. I did not hear her. Jimenez. Jimenez? Maybe it's Jimenez. I think you're right. Um, And then Roshan Amadi, who is the shield. And the other wild card that they recruit is Renoir or DJ Ren Thomas. Um, He's the fighter position and Amika plays the role of the architect. Um, We don't like DJ Ren. He's kind of annoying. And there's other reasons we don't like him, but he's also just kind of annoying. He's just like a pompous a-hole. Yeah. Okay. You know, those, maybe you didn't have this experience. I had some experiences with people who were just like really into like, I I don't know how to say this without disparaging what people enjoy, but there was a very specific type of dude who was really into like dubstep and EDM and like made that Mm -hmm. their whole personality. That's who he makes me think of. He, so (laughs) He's very much a gatekeeper for someone who is also a wild card. Yes. Just saying. Nope, that that is that is very accurate. 
So he is a musician, hence the DJ Ren part of his name, but he's also made a name for himself as a Warcross player. But he did not get picked first. He did not get picked first. Let's go, Amika. Mm -hmm. Um, Something that I found really interesting, which I'm just now thinking about, is none of them go by their, like, gamer tags. Like, we don't have gamer tags. Well... I I didn't think about that, but Amiko says, at least during the opening ceremony, like the opening game, anyone mm-hmm. who competes like in the official Warcross competitions, they have to use their actual likeness in game. Right. I just thought it so, was interesting. I wonder if that also extends to their names. That would make sense. But I, because like even in video game competitions that we have, we people are better known by their tag yeah like by their gamer tag like the the big one that i always think of even though i know he's kind of outdated is ninja right he calls ninja by his name Mm -hmm. that's yeah just it crossed my mind because my Mm -hmm. sister and you did but then the class under you um has a, a a guy in it who is a well, was a Twitch streamer and is now a YouTube streamer and he streams video games. Like I know him by his gamer tag, but Mm -hmm. he like used to professionally play Halo. Like he was playing with Ninja Hmm. a couple times. No kidding. Yeah. So like, I just think that's kind of cool. So shout out to Unsurpassable Z, whom I know does not listen to our podcast. (laughs) But like- (laughs) We, we, We can um link in the description. Yeah, so we should we should link to his YouTube channel. He does he does really cool stuff. He does a lot with Stardew Valley. Um, he's kind of friends with the creator of Stardew Valley. So like that's oh, that's cool. cool. Right? I've always wanted to play Stardew Valley, but I never have. I, I'm afraid I would get too obsessed with it. That's a mood. I think it would be a game that we would both really like. Mm-hmm. Actually, I might bring that back up later though. Um, like games like Stardew Valley, because that's another interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna just gonna put a pin in that. I'm just putting a note there. Okay. So I was going to say, I wonder if maybe just going back to the gamer tag thing, I wonder if it's because the Warcross players are treated almost more as athletes than as gamers. I can see that. It, the whole it still feels itself. weird, but yeah. Yeah. The whole competition itself very much read more like the Olympics to me. I agree. I was very hardcore thinking of the Olympics. When when was this published? Um 2017. That's just a wild guess. I'm going to actually look it up now. <laughs> Wait, I have the book <laughs> directly in front of me. Let's just look at the publication date in the front cover of the book, you moron. Um 2017, um, I was correct. So it was maybe written during the 2016 Olympics, which would make a lot of sense. That's true. I was um, high on medication after getting my wisdom teeth taken out during the 2016 Olympics. So I don't remember anything from them. I was watching it. Okay, here we go. It was a summer Olympics. Right. I was watching at my best friend from college's house. And we were rating the dives on the state of the diver's eyebrows. (laughs) (laughs) This sounds like a very Rachel activity. Like, we would be like, oh, that was a pretty good dive. But did you see her eyebrows? Like, (laughs) excuse me. (laughs) Um, This is not the 2016 Olympics, but it would have been the 2018 Olympics. Um, I was the only person in my friend group who had a television at college. So one of my friends who was really into ice skating wanted to come and watch all of the ice skating. And I didn't know anything about ice skating, but I would be watching with her because it's a little tiny dorm room, right? And I just, I, I, I could feel myself judging like, ooh, that was bad. And I was like, Maggie, you can barely skate straight. Just shut up. <laughs> I've never been ice skating. Really? It's on my bucket list of like things that I want to do, but I've never been ice skating. Next time you come visit, we should go ice skating. I mean, it might, maybe not next time because it'll the be next spring. Time? Yeah. <laughs> the next time I come up in the winter. There we go. There's a pretty decent ice skating rink not too far from here. I, I only went that. there once. 
I only know that because of my friend who really liked ice skating. That makes sense. Maggie, before we continue discussing the characters, can I ask the question that you put like all the way up at the top of our notes? Oh, yes. If you played a game of Warcross, what position do you think you would play? I really like the idea and maybe, hmm. I really like the idea of the position of the architect because mm-hmm. they just get the tools to like mess with the environment, which is also a really cool thing, by the way, because most games that exist right now don't have the level of environmental interaction that there is in Warcross. Indeed. Which I like. I think the biggest it was astounding. game would like competitive game would be like Fortnite. Yes, I think that's but a fair even, comparison. Even then it's like not like Warcross is much more advanced. Yes. I was going to call Fun. it tactile, which is not the correct <laughs> word. <laughs> but I knew what you were trying to say. Yes. Also, fun fact, I once made it into the top two in in Fortnite without killing anybody, and then I died. (laughs) I just hid the whole time, and I made it into the top two, and then they killed me. It was kind of tragic. Really good at making it into the top ten of Fortnite by myself. Really? Um, Yes. Uh, Nobody ever wants to play with me, though, because I'm terrible at aiming. Ah, uh, I get ditched for my sister's fiance all the time. Oof. Yeah, we'll put that's it that rough, way. buddy. I know it's fine. I, it's I'm fine. very good at Tetris Battle Royale. Um, I can there's see that. a there's a te- it's called Tetris 99 for the Nintendo Switch, and it was free. And I'm Tetris obsessed. So anyway, not related to what we were talking about, but I wanted to throw no, that out there. Not at all. <laughs> Um, what position do you think you'd like to play, Rachel? Uh, I can tell you what position I would not want to play. Yes. I would not make a good fighter. I would also not make a good fighter. (laughs) I feel like I could make a good shield. Mm -hmm. Because it's literally, like, just your job to shield people. Right. I really like the idea of the architect, but I also like the idea of being the thief. I think you'd be a good thief. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The fighter is kind of the primary offensive player and the shield is kind of the primary defensive player. Mm-hmm. Whenever I, I, I had a brief stint as a middle school basketball player and I was always better at defense than offense. So I also like the position of shield. I feel like that's more in my skill set, but I yeah. digress. I'm much more of a defender than an offender, just in general. You're so offensive, Rachel. I know. Um, but the thief isn't really an offense nor a defense position. Like, the thief just runs around and takes crap from you. Yes. And like, technically, they're, everybody's goal is to get the, the gem or whatever. The gem, the artifact, right? Yes. That the captain has. So that's kind of their goal more than anyone else's but also it's still not like a a fighty position Mm -hmm. yeah I agree can we talk about the player like Amika's teammates quick yes I love them okay so the team captain Asher Wing um he's I think he might be my favorite but I really love all of them I kind of go back and forth Okay. So um, let's talk about let's talk about Asher. Um, so he his older brother Daniel is an actor, question mark. He's either an actor or he does like stunts in movies. I couldn't remember and I did not look it back up. I think he's an actor. Okay. Um, they're not close. That's all we really know in this book. We learn more about them in Wildcard, but they're not. We just know that they don't. They're they're not. Right close brothers um he does use a wheelchair so he's the disabled character that we were talking about earlier and i think that Mm -hmm. adds a really interesting dimension to the story um and reader yeah go ahead sorry he's a team captain who 
in our normal life would be perceived as weak or lesser than because he's mm-hmm. in a wheelchair. But in the game, he's not. And and in real life, he isn't either. Yeah. I really liked the kind of commentary that Warcross had. It wasn't very it wasn't a lot, but I liked how it commented on the importance of having gaming be accessible and how gaming can improve accessibility. Like, how video games can improve accessibility of the world, I guess. Um, I might link this in the description, but there was a really good series of videos from a YouTube channel I watch called Game Maker's Toolkit, where they talked about different ways of making gaming accessible and how games already succeed at that or how they often fail at that. Um, mm-hmm. Everything from like colorblindness modes to adaptive controls and things like that. So. I may link that in the description if that's something you're interested in. I thought that was really good. And it's not something that gets talked about a lot, I think, in mainstream gaming circles, which if you know mainstream gaming circles probably wouldn't surprise you, but I digress. You were going to read that last little comment under Asher's. I was going to read that last little comment under Asher's. So readers familiar with Marie Lou's other work might recognize Asher's last name. Um, So allegedly he's a distant ancestor to a main character in the Legend Trilogy, um, which apparently Marie Lou said somewhere, but I couldn't find like any exact tweets or like posts about it. So I'm just taking everybody else's word for it. Again, this book has a lot of Easter eggs. So that does not surprise me. Um, So that might contribute a little bit to why I really liked Asher. um, Because he has a very similar like confidence to the point of like cocky but not a jerk asher has reason to be cocky like he is a really good warcross player Mm -hmm. and he's a really good captain too oh like he's good at pushing his team to do their best without overdoing it yes he has a justified cockiness yeah um I think sometimes he can push them a little hard Mm -hmm. and sometimes needs reminders to step back, but I don't think he ever crosses that, that boundary. And I think having those reminders are where, like, the characters that often sort of remind him to pull back a little bit are Hammy and Roshan. Yeah. (laughs) Who do you want to talk about first? Pick one. Um, I love Hammy. Let's talk about Hammy. I love Hammy. My favorite quote from the book comes from Hammy. Oh, that's right. Do you want to read it? Oh, wait, you don't have... (laughs) You you texted it to me or wrote it down. Yes. Um, So this is later in the book, and we'll give context to the quote a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Um, But what you need to know is that Hammy is talking to Amika, also known as Emmy. So Hammy says, when you refuse to ask for help, it takes... It, sorry, it tells others that they also shouldn't ask for help from you, that you look down on them for needing your help, that you f- like feeling superior to them. It's an insult, Emmy, to your friends and peers. So don't be like that. Let us in. Uh. <laughs> I just, I'm someone who normally gets asked a lot of questions, especially at work from mm-hmm. more than just my students. Um, and I don't ask for help from anyone. Mm-hmm. And this just reminds me that it's okay to ask for help. Yes. I think that's a really big running theme in this book too, because Emmy has, Emika, or yeah, has always been kind of on her own. Like her dad is gone. Her mother has never been in her life. She doesn't have any close friends. And she's never really had this kind of community of people to support her until she ends up playing Warcross with the Phoenix Riders. And I thought that was... She's still like an only player. Like she plays like she's the only one there. Right. And they finally have to set her straight. That feels so mean to say that, but I swear that's the name of the brand. Oh, I know. I know. Um. I also really just liked her relationship to Amika in general. Like, yeah, it was very, how do I put this? It was wholesome and 
good without feeling tokeny. Like a lot of times, and authors of any gender can be guilty of this. I feel like sometimes when you have a female her- heroine, it's often like, oh, we should give another like female side character so that this passes the Bechdel test, right? Which mm. is a stupid, I shouldn't say it's stupid. It is not always the most helpful baseline because the bar is so stinking low, but I digress. Right. But I felt like with this book, their relationship just felt very genuine and important to the story. I agree. I, I like Hammy. I have a question. <laughs> yes. Um, were Hammy and Asher a thing? I thought so. Okay, here's where I got messed up. Okay. <laughs> I here's where I got messed up on my reread. I know I knew that Roshan, who we haven't talked about yet, but we'll get to him eventually. I knew that he had some kind of history with somebody in Warcross, right? He had had some yes. weird past relationship. Yes. Um, I thought <laughs> when I started my reread, I thought he and Asher were kind of a thing now. I don't know why. <laughs> I know. And then I was reading, I was like, nope, I was wrong. We're fine. Everything's fine. But I do think there is something with Asher and Hammy, especially like at the end of the second book. Okay, Spoilers, I, I guess, but not really. Wanted to make sure that I was uh, on the right page. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, I, I mean, that I felt like Asher and Hammy had a relationship, but Asher and Roshan were like best friends. I that is correct. I think that is correct. Okay. Um, I just was completely wrong. <laughs> I appreciate you laughing at my confession because it makes me feel better. Okay, well, we already had that conversation about those those scenes. <laughs> Which we can probably talk more about in the next episode. One of them happens in this book. Oh, shoot. You're right. Well, we'll get to that. I feel like we need to keep things moving along. We've got a lot we haven't talked about yet. <laughs> yes, we do. So the the only other character that you have written down here is Tremaine. He is a demon birdgate. Whoa. Birdgate? <laughs> yep. <laughs> demon birdgate. Demon brigade player um Mm -hmm. he's kind of a butthole he used to play for the phoenix writers so he knows all of the original phoenix Mm -hmm. writers and has a history with roshan yeah that's who i got mixed up with (laughs) yes (laughs) yes and i do really like roshan too by the way i'm just gonna throw that out there i yes like him he's very he feels like the kind of person who would play the role, who would play the position of shield. I know that doesn't entirely make sense, but he just feels like that no, kind of, he I, has that I, kind of personality. Yeah. Tremaine. So I'm, I'm going to say it because you have the word on our notes. Mm-hmm. Um, Tremaine is the type of asshole that I like. <laughs> <laughs> But do you know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. Like, he's a sweet asshole. Yes. Although he is more... He is he's mostly a jerk asshole. in this book. Yeah. 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 But I, I could never bring myself to hate him. I agree. He never, like... He kind of talked trash, but not in the typical gamer talk trash. Right. Like... It was more just like trash talk without being like racist, misogynistic, et cetera, et cetera. So. so we both said so at the same time. It really <laughs> threw me off. What, what were you going to say, Rachel? So we've just finished our discussion of the characters. Maggie, do you want to talk a little bit more about the neural link and the kind of world building that goes into it. And then we can t- kind of talk about the plot as we do that. Yeah. Okay. So I was really interested in, I only remember this because while we were taking our little break, I was flipping back through the book and there's this moment when, what page um, are we on? this isn't actually what I was going to look for, but this is close enough. 
Um, so this is page 77 in the hardback. This is after um, Amika has arrived in Tokyo. Um, and she's, I believe this is someone driving her. Also, why did the font just randomly change in my book? What? I didn't do it. <laughs> That's weird. Um, whatever. Anyway, this person she's speaking to says to her, here, almost everything you do will earn you points towards your level in the link, as in the neural link, going to school, going to work, cooking dinner, and so on. Your level can earn you rewards in the real world, anything from popularity with your classmates to better service in restaurants to an edge over others for a job interview. So I thought that was really interesting how neural, the neural link has become so ingrained in society that the points that you acquire virtually affect your standing in quote unquote real life, which is something that people have talked about. Um, there's some Ted talks by somebody that I watched. I actually also read a book by her. Her name's Jane McGonigal. Um, and she doesn't really talk about it as much in her Ted talks, but in her book kind of talking about how to gamify life. Right. And like, why is it so easy for me, for example, to sink 500 hours into Animal Crossing during virtual chores for no actual reward? Like, why do I spend hours of my day chopping down digital trees to make digital furniture for my digital house and my digital animal friends? And it's the same thing with like Stardew Valley. Why are we pretending to this farm that does not exist and spending more time doing that than we are like tending to our real lives? And there's a lot of talk about like, well, like games have a reward system. Well, how do we translate that to the real world? And I thought it was interesting how the neural link kind of creates that and how those points that you gain from doing real world tasks also affect the real world. But it feels more like a game because you get constantly rewarded and affirmed. Mm -hmm. There's one scene where like Amika looks at a plant in an office and it's like, water me for like plus one point or something like that. You're making a face. Was that in this book or was that in the next book? I thought it was in this book because I thought I just saw it. It could have been. Maggie, I listened to them. Okay, no here we go. <laughs> Page 93. Um, it's potted ficus floats above a green plant with the words water plus one, hinting that I would earn a point if I watered it makes sense so which i'm just gonna throw this out here that would be a much if that kind of system became more um prevalent throughout the rest of the world in the world of warcross like this book it would be a much better solution to the problem that hideo is trying to solve through other means Correct. Um, <laughs> I just had a very teeny tiny little brain blast. And yeah, go it on. All the way back to our beginning discussion of virtual versus augmented reality. Mm -hmm. Iron Man has augmented reality. Yes. <laughs> just it popped into my head. So like Jarvis and Friday mm -hmm. and Karen are all pieces of augmented reality so if you're yeah. still struggling with the augmented reality idea mm -hmm. think iron man yes yeah like what he sees through his helmet or visor or whatever is augmented reality right that is a Possibly. very good comparison i got you but i appreciate like the day rachel day brain blast knowledge. moment <laughs> I feel like we need to have a little jingle when one of us has a brain blast or like a light bulb moment to just like stick in the podcast. Like, exactly. <laughs> Precisely. Um, yeah. So do we want to talk about the plot now since you kind of referenced Hideo's goal? Yeah. So I think we're going to be a little bit spoilery from this point forward. So bear that in mind if you haven't read Warcross or if you haven't read Warcross and you don't care about spoilers, here we go. Okay, before we even start about the spoiler stuff, can we talk about the beginning? Yeah, sure. So the thing that still bothers me is that Amika's bounty hunts keep getting sniped from her. Which yeah. Is, that pisses me off and we don't ever get a solution. So what the heck, Marie Lou? Like I thought that was strange. I 
I mean, I guess sometimes you just get bad luck and there's no real explanation for it, but it did feel like weird to point that out and then not have anything come of it. It felt like the gun was left on the wall. Yes. Would you like my little head canoon? <laughs> sure. For anybody who doesn't know, I misspelled hand- head cannon once and it uh, has stuck as head canoon. Head canoon. Um, <laughs> Tell me your head canoon, Rachel. <laughs> Tremaine was the one sniping her bounties. Ooh. Good take. I have no foundation for it, just so that they're both bounty hunters in the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which we do find out later. Tremaine is also one of oh. the bounty hunters <laughs> that. Yes. Why are we laughing? <laughs> Because I forgot we hadn't talked about that yet. Well, I mean, we already said we were going to talk about spoilers, so. This but yeah, because that's a really good point, because Tremaine is another one of the bounty hunters that Hideo hired to try and catch Zero. And we don't really find this out until the end of the book, but um, he ends up kind of looking out for Amika a little bit at the end, and I think it's very sweet. Yeah, at the end of this book, and then like through the next one. Throughout Wildcard as well. Um, he ends up like at the end, he's like, Hey, here's the information I have do with it. What you will. I'm out of this. This is getting too crazy for me. And mm-hmm. he's not out of it. Cause he comes back in wild card, but like, you know, he tried. Okay. But part of the reason he comes back in wild card is because of Roshan. That's true. But we're, we're not talking about wild. We card. are so getting ahead of ourselves right now. <laughs> okay. So back at the beginning, she's on a bounty hunt. Doesn't go well, gets sniped from her, whatever. She goes back mm-hmm. home her apartment that she's getting evicted from she has three days to turn in what like four thousand dollars yeah it's it's a it's a big chunk of change yes that she doesn't have and like literally three days away from it um so she has an interaction with her landlord whom she calls mr like asshole or something but that's not actually his name Mm -hmm. but the way she pronounces it it kind of sounds like that um (laughs) Right, like she makes a comment about yeah. this. Yeah, no, I, I I remember that. Um, and then we have the opening ceremonies with her and her roommate when she glitches into the game. Yada yada yada. The next day, it opens up, and Amika has like a hundred calls from this unknown number, mm-hmm. and she eventually calls them back and is like, "Hello." She gets a call directly from Hideo. Technically, it, it like was through his secretary and then she, but she connects them. Yes. So she has a direct like one on one conversation with Hideo and Hideo's like, yeah, so I'm uh, going to fly you out to Tokyo right now. And she's like, huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> she can like hardly speak because she's she's had this like. It's not a crush on Hideo, but like. In admiration, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Like a dream of being like him. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, I have all these responsibilities here. And he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Like, we'll come and get your stuff. There's a car waiting for you outside. Like, we've even taken care of your rent. And she goes, like, she hangs up with Hideo and pounds on her her landlord's Landlord's door. door. And he's just, like, dumbfounded. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Flabbergasted flabbergasted is one of my favorite words Hideo paid for like a year rent Mm -hmm. and she's not even gonna live there for like the next what two three months yeah but she does mention um like that her roommate is still there and her roommate's been really struggling and yeah she says maybe having this kind of breathing room will let her get back on her feet we never hear about the roommate again but it's kind of okay with me yeah she was she was there um and then she flies on the private jet which every piece of technology that Hideo has anything to do with is automatically integrated with the neural link so mm-hmm. like the plane's really cool the cars are really cool and then she lands in Tokyo and all this stuff and then we meet up with Hideo we get we first we get the rules about like don't take any pictures don't ask about his family then we meet up with Hideo and then we have the like choosing ceremony, the wild card, <laughs> the wild card selection. I don't remember the what draft. it was called. The draft, <laughs> the war draft. I'm an idiot. It's only like the pivotal moment of the book or anything. 
I think we're both idiots because we uh, little idiots. <laughs> little idiots. Reference to conversation we had off mic. Indeed, but we are both just little idiots, but it's fine. Little idiots. Um she gets chosen. So yeah, she goes through the war draft. We have the whole like beginning of the training montage. She doesn't trust anyone. She's kind of talking to Hideo off and on about the stuff. Mm-hmm. And then at one point, I don't exactly remember where this comes in, but like, can I talk about Hideo and Amika? Of course. At one point he calls her and is like, you haven't called me in three days. And she's like, well, I didn't really have anything to tell you. As in updates for the job that he hired her for. And they have this little back and forth. And she's like, well, did you miss me? Like, did you want me to call you with nothing? And he was just like, well, I wouldn't mind. Like, <laughs> No, ho- let me find what he says. Cause it's really, it, it's kind of dramatic. It's kind of um, Hideo's like one moment of being a dramatic child, but not child, but something. Give me one second. I've just completely ignored like all of the other plot points except for Amika and Hideo and I'm totally fine with that. (laughs) They have a really, I really like the relationship that develops between them. Yes. I think it felt very natural. I agree. Um, Let me go back. I think it's back a little bit more. Uh, while Maggie's looking for that. Oh, I found um, it. I found it. I found it. Never mind. I hit the mic with the book. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're talking. Also, um, Amika's in the pool, which adds another dimension of something when they're communicating. So there's that. Um, okay. Is this way? It, I mean, Amika says, is this your way of telling me I should be making faster progress? He looks back at me, his expression partly hidden in shadows. It's my way of asking if I can help you out. I thought I was the one helping you out. He pauses again, but in the dim light, his head turns slightly toward me to reveal the hint of a smile on his lips. His eyes hold mine for a moment. I'm glad the darkness that I'm glad for the darkness that hides my reddening cheeks. I know you're exhausted, he finally says. I brush away I look away and brush beads of water from my arm. No pity needed. None given. I wouldn't have put you there if you couldn't handle it. Always with his knowing attitude. If you want to help me out, I say, as I sink back into the water, you could always offer some moral support. Moral support. He turns to face me, his smile turning playful. And what kind of moral support would you like? I don't know, some encouraging words? Hideo raises an eyebrow at me in amusement. Very well. He takes a step closer to me. I'm checking in because I miss hearing from you, he says. Does that help? I pause with my mouth open, my momentary bravado disappearing. Before I can reply, he bids me goodnight and disconnects our chat. Dramatic, but effective. I I want this scene from Hideo's perspective, because I just have this image of him, like, panicking on the inside of this entire conversation. I I agree. (laughs) <laughs> I think any interaction between Hideo and Amika from Hideo's perspective would be an experience. <laughs> well, because here's, okay. This is what I said about the book. Let me find my update so I can read it to you verbatim. Because there's a point where um, Amika actually goes to Hideo's house with him and he shows her something new that he's implemented in the neural link, which is a way for two users to connect and share emotions and thoughts basically telepathically which is pretty rad um if not slightly terrifying and well, after the after, point is you only share with people that you really care about right and it's all like consensual it's not like yeah Impossible. anyway what i said after that point in the book was i really respect marie lou for being like how do we get the emotionally repressed man to express his feelings and decided that the solution was he invents telepathy <laughs> Which is just a big galaxy brain moment, if you ask me. I mean, honestly, it makes sense. It makes total sense. And I did really like it. I'm not making fun of the book. It was just, 
it was something I was like of course um but I I love Hideo and I love Mm -hmm. Amika and I do really like their relationship like me too as you said it seems very real like it seems natural um but funny story not related to them exactly but related to the story that I was telling Maggie was I didn't realize he had hired other bounty hunters (laughs) oh until like three quarters of the way through the book he only kind of mentions it in passing and we don't hear anything from any of them well so Amika is always like I wonder if they're the other bounty hunter I wonder if they're one of the other bounty hunters and I like I was just like okay there are other bounty hunters in the world and then I was like wait there are other bounty hunters out for zero yes (laughs) and I was like I'm an idiot (laughs) little idiots little idiots Uh, maybe that should be the name of our podcast (laughs) (laughs) no I like our name too much to change it now it took us a really long time to decide on that name we're not changing it nope um but I was just fascinated by the other bounty hunters because we Mm -hmm. only know of one other one and that's Tremaine that's Tremaine um but we don't know there there had to have been at least one other one yeah um we never really hear anything about the other hunters not at all but the whole reason that Amika was talking to Hideo was because she got an update from a piece of the game or from one of her memories where like she was able to get this little piece of data and then she needed Hideo's support in figuring it out because it had a fractal key so the key was always changing and developing in infinity or to infinity Mm -hmm. so they figured it out they unlock it they can't really read the information but they do realize that they need to go to the dark world the dark right the dark net whatever the dark world there we go and go to a pirate ship (laughs) because what else would you find in the dark internet but in the pirate ship we see zero Mm -hmm. and we see another character do we want to talk about that other character we said spoilers so yeah anything goes so we see I'm pulling up his name because I know I'll say it. Ren. Yes, we see Ren there and he's communicating with Zero. Um, which isn't good because Zero is the bad guy. Yes. And we realize that Zero, or sorry, that Ren is working for Zero. Correct. And they are pulling, well, placing bets on an underground illegal Warcross game um where they are the bets being small, placed small bets that are good global coordinates right um and they are all like major cities right and ren gets the ones for tokyo right which is kind of terrifying because that's where they are that's where they are right now That's where all of the Warcross players are right now. Even though the game is virtual, all of the Warcross players come together physically so that they can eliminate, like, lagging issues, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or at least negate them. Yeah. Um, So that's not good. That we're targeting Tokyo. Or anywhere, really. Right. And while this is all happening... Amika is also going through this like training montage on like getting up to speed with the rest of the Phoenix Riders and Mm -hmm. Um, and we love that for her she's actually really good at what she does I really enjoy the games in some ways like it would be easy to just write the games as filler because they're not really what the story is about but they Mm -hmm. add so much extra life to the world And I think they're also really good for character development as well. And Amika, like, learning to work with her team, even though it is just a Warcross game, or quote-unquote, just a Warcross game. But yeah. There's a rant about that. Yeah, there's there's more that could be said, but... Yes. But in the middle of one of those games, Zero kind of kidnaps her digital avatar. Yep. And they have a whole conversation 
while in the middle of a, a Warcross game. Mm-hmm. And so she can't help her team. Fortunately, they still win the match. But as the match ends, somebody makes an assassination attempt on Hideo because he's there at the arena watching the game. Right. And fortunately, he lives. Yes. And it's partially because Amika warns him. Mm -hmm. Like, split second before. She sends him, like, a quick message over the Neuralink and basically saves his life. Yeah. The only person who is hurt is one of Hideo's bodyguards, and it's, like, just it, it's it's just a flesh wound like it's not it's just a scratch it's just a, it's just a scratch it was more than just a scratch but that's besides the point but he lives and that's what matters yes um at one point there's a really confusing makeout scene that <laughs> maggie and i had a whole little debate about but it was it was very spicy for a ya book I'm not the one to make a judgment of that. I thought so too, but it was also kind of vague. I am the one to make the judgment call on that. <laughs> okay. I Wait, trust between Rachel's the two judgment. Of us, I, I concur. It was spicy for a YA book. Mm-hmm. Um, Which also makes this not... I don't think content necessarily determines the age group that a book is intended no. for, but we've talked about this and I think this is kind of interesting to talk about. If new adult was treated as like a real genre and not as something to be made fun of mm-hmm. by the book community at large, I feel like Warcross would, feels almost more like new adult than young adult. Like the characters are older. I think actually when I was reading, so in the book, Amika is 18, Hideo is 21. And I think Rachel and I both kind of aged them up a little bit just because they felt yeah. they read older than they were. I think if I had to give them an age, I would say Amika felt much more like a 21-year-old and Hideo felt much more like a 25-year-old. I've met many 21 them one. <laughs> I've met <laughs> I I attended college. I, I I knew very many 21-year-old males, male humans. Um They're stupid. Yeah. <laughs> that's the best way I can put it and I'm sure maybe there could be like some cultural differences there because I went Mm. to school in the United States and Hideo did not um but that said I do think that Hideo just seemed very collected for a 21 year old guy and like a billionaire CEO yeah okay you know what good for him but yeah. Yes, yes. Good for him. Like in all in all seriousness, good for him. But he definitely read older than 21. Yeah. There is a certain like suspension of disbelief I think you have to bring into this book, which mm-hmm. is fine. Like the thing with this this wow. Let's try that again. The thing with suspension of disbelief is like as long as I'm happy to suspend my disbelief, then we're good. And I think with this book, like some of the things, a lot of the things that happen to Amika are very like, oh, because she's the main character, like being the first pick in the war draft, right? Or like her being able to hack into um, the game, like her being this gifted hacker, like that just has main character energy, but it doesn't really bother me because I'm like, yeah, that's just part of the book. She's supposed and same, to be the main character. Yeah. And same with like Hideo being the billionaire, like that is like, yeah, that might seem a little bit of a stretch, but that is, that is a moment where I'm okay with suspending my disbelief. I agree. Um, I think we should talk about the end of the book. I agree. Since I just gave a very poorly done rendition of the beginning of the book, do you want to finish the book for us? So... Yeah, I'll, I'll give a really quick rundown of some things that happen. Um, Zero attacks the Phoenix Rider, like, dormitories, and fortunately, everyone makes it out okay. Um, but after that, um, both Amika and Ren are disqualified from the games. Yes. And so they're disqualified from the Phoenix Riders. They cannot compete anymore. We never hear from Ren again. So good riddance is all I can say. 
Honestly, I was a little confused by that because I felt like he should have shown up more, but like, whatever. You do you. I didn't really care for him, so I was like, eh, goodbye. Yeah, he gave me the creeps. Mm -hmm. So that all happens, but Amika's like, I still got a job to do, and so she's trying to find a way to she gets some help. I think that's when Tremaine reaches out to her, right? And he gives her his information from the bounty hunt. And using that, Amika realizes that Zero is planning some kind of attack on the final game of the Warcross Championships. So she goes to the Dark World. She gets all these illegal power-ups. She decides, she tells her teammates, she says, I'm going to hack into the world, the Warcross Championships and I need you to help me stop Zero from whatever he's trying to do. I'm going to interject because right yes. after the explosion, Amika's in the hospital and Hammy and Roshan are talking to her. And that's when Hammy does the whole quote that I really like about like, you need to ask mm-hmm. for help and it's okay to do that. Like, we are here to help you. We are your teammates. Right. And then she does. Yes. So we really got that nice character growth there and I appreciated it. Agreed. Um, yeah. So all that happens, we, we defeat Zero, everything is fine and good, except then, am I telling things out of order? You're making a face. No, I'm making the face at what is to come. So then we come to find out, Hideo tells Amika the truth about what was supposed to happen with the Neuralink at the championships. And Zero what did happen? Her a breadcrumb of like, yes, you, you just screwed everything up. Mm-hmm. And so Amika confronts Hideo, right? Yeah. And he tells her what happened, which is that he pushed out an update with through the Neuralink that created this algorithm. And mm-hmm. we all know about algorithms, but this algorithm is a little different. This algorithm will be able to prevent anyone connected to the Neuralink or anyone who has ever connected to the Neuralink. It will prevent them from being able to commit crime. Someone Go who ahead. has connected to the Neuralink since the update. Yes. It, it doesn't retroactively work. You have to connect with it at some point to get mm-hmm. the algorithm. And then even if you're not actively connected to it, it can happen. Right. So we already know that the neural link devices connect with the human brain, right? Well, Hideo has found a way to affect the brain chemicals and juices and whatever. And if someone is planning like a violent attack, like say, let's say Steve over here is planning to go rob the drugstore, right? Well, the, the algorithm will change the chemicals in his brain to make him not want to rob the drugstore anymore. Which, on the surface, you know, sounds great. Except once you turn your brain back on, then you realize, oh, there's a lot of ethical dilemmas that have to do with this, like taking away a person's free will, or what happens when one person, as in Hideo, is the one deciding what is a crime and what isn't. But Hideo doesn't see it that way he sees it as a much more black and white situation than like yes. this area with a massive gray zone mm-hmm. Hideo's like well it's a machine it's subjective like yes but Hideo you created the machine right and nothing created by a human being can ever be objective right and we will not take any arguments on that because we can prove our point we just don't want to yeah it reminded me a lot of, um, I know, Rachel, you said it reminded you of Minority of Report. Yes, it did. Um, I've not seen Minority Report in a couple of years, but I remember it. I have not seen it either. And it is now a TV show. So it's a movie and a TV show. Oh. And within Minority Report, the movie, because that's the only one I've seen, you have these three humanish beings. Yeah, that something kind of- like that. <laughs> Yeah, that can kind of predict the future of specifically murders. So Mm -hmm. any sort of planned out murders are just no longer existent um, because the moment you think about it and start plotting, like you will be taken down. So every type of murder is 
second degree murder, which just means it wasn't planned and happened in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, There's like a five minute window of when they get the alert to when the murder actually happens. Yeah. Which this very much reminded me of. Mm -hmm. It reminded me a lot of person of interest, which was Mm -hmm. an okay TV show from a couple years ago. I liked the first couple of seasons. The last couple were eh, but whatever. Um, because in that you have a machine that generates numbers, I think it is. It's been a long time since I've watched it. But these numbers are supposed to be of people who are going to be violent criminals based on data that it's gathered from like surveillance cameras around the world. But when it's made, they have to decide, well, we're getting so much data. We have to decide what are the numbers worth acting on and what are the numbers that we decide are like, okay, that like, yeah, we can let this crime still happen. Which like, if it's a crime, there shouldn't be a debate as to which one is the worthier crime to go after. And I think that speaks to the bias that can happen with some, with this kind of algorithm or machine, right? Like Hideo, even if the machine is the one doing all the work, Hideo is still the one who's deciding what is a crime and what isn't. Or like what happens when nations start saying, hey, Hideo, if we slide you a trillion dollars, can you just have your your little algorithm look the other way as we're committing war crimes? Like, you know, I want to believe that Hideo is a good person. And I do think he is. And I think he's well-intentioned, but he's still human. I definitely agree. And I was so mad when this happened. I immediately texted you, Maggie. You texted me and you were like, what? And I I was was said, so mad. I'm so sorry, Rachel. No, it's good when I have these strong emotions. It's good to have strong feelings. I'm invested in it. And like, mm-hmm. we, we, you want that from a book. Like you want to feel yeah. invested. Oh, when I say I was ready to punch a day across the face. Oh, I was so And mad. he has his reasons. And I think they are mostly noble reasons, but this is not the way to solve this problem. Actually, what I was trying to say earlier was why don't we, why doesn't this sort of reward system that exists in the Neuralink already, why don't we create, why don't we build that up so that like there is more of a reward system of like, oh, if you do this, you'll earn points. But like, hey, let's say you steal gum from your classmate. Maybe you that get five less tracked. points. Yeah. Right. Which still has some moral questionability, but not as much as this. This is straight up unethical. Right. Because at least with the like virtual reward system, it is virtual. Right. And you still get like, you still have choice. Right. You still have bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. But the whole reason that Hideo does this is because when he was younger, his brother went missing and we we find that out in this book when mm-hmm. Hideo takes Amika to go see his parents we learn and I that. love his parents oh my gosh it's such a good scene and they are just so sweet and like mm-hmm. that's when we have the heavy makeout session oh in in the they go to the hot springs <laughs> right yeah that's I... hot you good right terrible joke Maggie terrible I joke know. I'm the worst. <laughs> but also during that, when they're not kissing, um, Hideo tells Anika about how he lost his younger brother, like his younger brother, Sasuke. Um, he just like vanished one day without a trace and they were never able to find him. And his family doesn't talk about it now. It's, it's, it is very sad. And he... Mm-hmm. He does it trying to get answers. He says to Amika, before we even find out about the algorithm, after he tells Amika about his brother, he says to her something like, everything I've ever done, I've done for him. 
which is great foreshadowing because Amiga just thinks, oh, he created Warcross in honor of his brother because he and his brother love to play games together. Well, no, he actually created the Neuralink so that he could create this algorithm so he could find whoever kidnapped his brother or caused his brother's disappearance. With, with those intentions, but that's how it... But that has, it has kind of led to this. Correct. <sighs> So yeah, the book ends with most of the people in the world under control of this algorithm, except for the people who have beta lenses. So the people um, competing. So the people competing, including Amika and her teammates and a handful of other like hackers and people who are familiar with like the dark net, dark world. Yeah. Feels a little dystopian at the end of the book. Not gonna lie. It feels like we went from a utopia to a dystopia. I mean, you could argue that every utopia is just a dystopia in disguise. That is also fair. So Maggie, how many stars did you give this book? I gave this book five stars, both the first time that I read it and this this most recent time that I read it. That's what the word I was looking for. That's Um, fair. I think... If, if I had to say, like, oh, the objective quality of this book, like, okay, I could see, like, someone rating it lower. But for me, when I read a book, it's mostly about my enjoyment. And I had a really grand time reading this book. So five stars from Maggie. That's fair. I gave it 4.5. So I'm, like, right there with you. Yeah. So. I think the only reason I knocked it down half a point is that some of it felt a little cliche. But. Mm-hmm. But again, all of our ratings are just personal preference. Let's be real. Right. I have no real rating system. It's all about I actually rights. had a discussion with some folks on the internet fairly recently where we were talking about like things like art. It's you can't really judge it objectively sometimes because a lot of it is just like subjective and like Yeah. Yeah. I like with books, like, yeah, I enjoyed it. So five stars for me. But like there's things I can say that made me like it, but I yeah. It's a whole yeah. other discussion. Indeed. But but highly recommended from both Rachel and me. Indeed. Maggie. Rachel. What's our next episode going to be? Our next episode, we are going to talk about the sequel to Warcross, which is Wildcard. What? So we will be discussing that. Um, one thing I did notice, and we'll probably talk about it more in the next episode, but our first two duologies that we did, so one of us is lying and one of us is next and then vicious and vengeful, both of those weren't really written as duologies. Um, one of us is lying was kind of a standalone with a sequel. And then there's going to be a third book and same Mm -hmm. kind of with vicious and vengeful. And allegedly there's a third book out there somewhere, but we haven't seen it yet. So, but Warcross was actually written as a duology. So we'll get to see this story come to a close in the next book. And we'll talk a lot about that. We'll talk more about Zero because he plays a huge role in the book. And we didn't talk about the big reveal. Oh, well, that is like the very last chapter. Okay. And fair enough. Would you like to share the big reveal, Rachel? Zero is is the brother. Yeah, he's Hideo's brother. I I predicted that. Do you remember? I do remember you predicting that. I had a whole bunch of like one, two, three, four. These are my predictions. And that mm-hmm. was like number two. That was one of them. So that's a whole thing that we just got that bomb dropped on us at the end of this book. And we have to process that in the next one. So yeah, I Indeed. guess we'll talk about that next time. Yes, we will. Just like yeah. how the book did it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But in the meantime, um, you know, you can always, I'm going to wrap us up. Is that okay with you? Totally fine with me. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, you can always find us on Twitter and Instagram at book expert pod, or you can send us an email at not the book expert at gmail.com. We also have a website where you can send us notes, leave reviews, or just read more about the podcast. That is um, bookexpertpod.wordpress.com. And all of those links, as always, will be in the description, as well as any books that we mentioned, any other random things we mentioned. The podcast episode description is really just a Trevor treasure. Wow. Let me try that again. (laughs) A Trevor treasure. 
a treasure trove of stuff. So, yeah. And I can't talk anymore. So I think it's time we wrap this episode up. Rachel, do you have anything else you want to say? Or are you still laughing at me? (laughs) I'm still laughing at you a little bit, but it's fine. Um, Thank you for having a really good choice for this one. I really enjoyed these. I am so glad you liked them. And I'm so excited to talk about, wow, I am on the struggle bus. I am really excited to talk about wildcard with you next. Me too. All right. (laughs) Well, we'll wrap things up and we will see you on our next episode. Bye, everybody. Bye.